Okay, hello everyone. Let me start. Unless there is a question in the chat, yeah. Um, so I'll finish. I'll finish the, the class of um, of last time. Um, does some of you have uh, questions on what we've seen last time? Or who remembers what we've seen last time? What? Uh, Yeah. One topic was a bit that uh, the Keynesian economics that, that focuses rather like on short term, um, how do you say, uh, short term defenses or opportunities, um, and, and where we see, or at least Keynes thought that the state uh, can, can influence a lot, um, especially with investing um, and on the state side. Yes, so that, that's right, Keynes insisted on in, uh, investment. Uh, in, in case there is a recession to, um, to put back the economy uh, on track and restore full employment. But Keynes is interested in the short run. I think you, you mentioned long term. Um, yes, and actually, so uh, right now, um, I'm going uh, to talk about uh, some Keynesian economists like Robert Solo, uh, who investigated the question of the long term uh, and more precisely, what makes an economy grow? Um, and uh, yeah, how, is, uh, how can we model growth of an economy? So um, I think most of you are familiar with math, so I've included some equation. Um, so Bob Solo and uh, Swan uh, develop uh, the, basically the same model independently, so it's called the Solo-Swan model or simply solo model. And it relies on the um, exogenous and constant saving rate. Uh, what does exogenous mean? Do, do you know? Yes? Uh, I guess it's something along the lines that comes from the outside. So it's not derived within the model. It's exactly. So it's not, as you say, it's not derived uh, in the model. It's uh, an input to the model that is not modeled as opposed to endogenous, uh, something endogenous to the model is a variable of the model that uh, uh, respond to, like is de determined by some equation within the model. So here, um, the important equation is the constant saving rates in blue. So K is the capital. So it's the total amount of uh, machines, building, uh, uh, that are necessary to produce output. Why? And uh, each year, a fraction S of Y is saved or invested, it's the same, and this increases capital. Okay, so we build more machines and it adds up to the stock of machines, the accumulation of capital. It's one of the reasons for growth, because output, the first equation, is produced from capital and labor. So labor is L. So here I use a very simplified version of uh, the solo model so that it can fit in uh, two lines. So I take uh, labor as fixed, it doesn't vary over time. But the productivity of labor grows at, grows at a constant rate G. It's uh, also exogenous um, growth. And, uh, and yeah, maybe I said something uh, wrong earlier. This is why the model is exogenous, actually. It's because the G is exogenous. The, the, the reason for productivity growth is exogenous. And so this number uh, L exponential of GT is uh, the amount of labor in labor unit. So in numbers of hour, it would be L, and it's fixed. But in labor unit that you can compare over time, uh, it's L exponential GT. It means that um, if um, in the Neolithic age to, to have uh, one, one piece of bread, you would need uh, uh, one year of work. Nowadays, with the technology, we need only uh, one hour. Uh, but it's the same uh, unit of work uh, th that is needed. It's just that the number of hours is um, multiplied uh, by uh, the technology. And uh, this type of production function um, is called the Cobb-Douglas. So it multiplies the capital 
times a constant uh, to the power of a constant below one, between zero and one, uh, times uh, to the effective labor, uh, times one minus alpha. Uh, it exhibits uh, what we call constant return to scale because if you double both the capital and the uh, effective labor, you will double output. Uh, although each factor of production, so capital or labor, has decreasing return. One uh, additional unit of capital contribute less and less to output uh, as it uh, increases. So, for example, if you, if you own a pizzeria, you would need uh, employees, like a pizzaiolo, and uh, a room. Okay, uh, if you, you have one employee, one room, if you take a second employee, maybe you can serve more pizza, but uh, not that many more because uh, you, you cannot accommodate too many customers because you're constrained by your room, which is a capital. And, and the same for capital. If you double the size of the room, you will be limited by the amount of labor. But if you double both, you can serve twice as many pizzas. Okay, now uh, we can, re so these are the two equations of the model, and uh, we can rewrite everything in terms of the capital, uh, the little k, which is the um, ratio of capital to effective labor. And uh, I'll spare you the, the details of the computation, but uh, basically by injecting uh, the production function into the, the savings rate uh, equation, and re-expressing in function of little k, you obtain uh, this equation on the left, which is the equation of motion of uh, the economy. And uh, there are, Solo is interested in steady state or balanced growth uh, equilibrium. That is, the little k uh, is, is constant, so the derivative with respect to time k dot is equal to zero. And uh, the equation is easy to solve if uh, you take k dot is equal to zero. You obtain uh, this uh, equation. Uh, so k star will denote uh, equilibrium when we have a star. So you have uh, a constant ratio of uh, capital to output, which is equal to the savings rate divided by the growth rate. So it means that uh, the more uh, the higher the exogenous savings rate, the higher the accumulation of capital, and so the, the higher the number of machines per, uh, per goods that are consumed every year is. And, um, and, uh, and yes, and G here is the total factor productivity. So it's uh, the growth in, uh, in technology, in, the, in technological progress, and uh, it cannot be measured. It, it's not uh, really the same as the, the growth in output uh, uh, y, or it's the same only along the, the steady state equilibrium, but uh, we're not necessarily uh, along this path. And um, what Solo did is that uh, he measured, um, so by total differentiating the, the production function, uh, and uh, knowing the growth of output, of capital, of labor from the data, he computed uh, this uh, solo residual, so the, the only thing that is unobservable, G. And uh, he claimed in the 57 paper that most of the growth, actually 90% of the growth rate in the, the previous decades in the US was due to total factor productivity growth rather than to capital accumulation through savings because these are the two basic factors, because uh, the population is also a factor that can explain growth, um, but this is pretty straightforward, you know how many, how, how your population has, has grown. Uh, this result has been uh, contested and, and now no, no one believes it, uh, because of uh, various reasons. Um, first, uh, actually, um, G um, is, um, also varies in, in function of the, the utilization rate of capital. So in this model, it's assumed that all the machines are used productively. But in the same way as there is unemployment, there are some plants that don't operate at full capacity and there are, uh, yeah, idle uh, resources. And, uh, and this uh, is partly captured by G. 
Uh, so it has been shown that G is correlated with things they should be, not be correlated with, like uh, all prices or meat respondings. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, when there are increasing returns, uh, which, uh, which is argues, arguably the case in some sector, then G doesn't measure productivity growth anymore. So yes, for a number of reasons, this result uh, is, is flawed. Um, and actually, Solo was a Canadian, and he reckoned that his problem, uh, that his model had some problem. Um, for example, a drop in investment doesn't lead to a recession in his model. It just, just leads to a, a lower growth rate. Uh, but there is no crisis. So, in a way, it's not necessarily a problem because um, in the neoclassical synthesis, we have uh, some models that uh, work for the short run that are Canadians, and, and this model, this is idealized for the long run. Camera is supposed to follow me, but it's not. Okay, I hope uh, they see me. Um, now, um, Edmund Phelps wrote a, a very funny paper, actually full of humor. He, the paper uh, starts with uh, once upon a time in the kingdom, uh, in the Solovian kingdom, referring to Bob Solo, uh, blah, blah, blah. And uh, the paper is written like a, a legendary story. And uh, the goal of the paper is uh, to, to understand what should be the savings rate, this exogenous parameter S in Solo's model. And uh, he popularized uh, the golden rule savings rate, which maximizes, so it's a savings rate that maximizes consumption at the steady state growth rate. So consumption, you can write it uh, like that. It is consumption per person. So uh, the con total consumption is the uh, output minus investment or savings. And uh, yeah, I divide and multiply by uh, exponential GT. Um, and actually, uh, yeah, it rewrites uh, like, like this because um, I use the, the definition of, uh, of little k and uh, the, the equation of, for the, the capital output ratio, S over G. Now, uh, if you maximize this equation respect to S, is the same as maximizing it with respect to little k because k is just a function of s. You can forget about the exponential gt because it has no s in it. And um, so, uh, you, you, so you differentiate that, you equalize to zero, and uh, you obtain this equation. So uh, the first term, uh, k to the power uh, alpha minus one times alpha, is actually the uh, rate of return to capital because, um, I mean, it's not obvious uh, written like that, but you could uh, see that, um, yeah, in neoclassical theory, factors of production are paid to their marginal productivity. So the derivative of output respect to capital, that is how much output increases with one marginal unit of capital, it's, uh, so the benefit of adding one unit of, of capital, it must be also its cost, so the rate of return to capital R. And, uh, and when you compute this uh, derivative of output with respect to, to capital, uh, it's exactly this um, on the, yeah, this term. And, uh, and this is equal to G, to the growth rate. So uh, the, the, the rate of return to capital uh, must be equal to G, uh, at the optimum. This is a way to express the golden rule savings rate. The other way is to express it directly in terms of uh, the savings rate. Uh, so for that, you, you again make use of the, the equation uh, of uh, the, the capital output ratio. And uh, so given the production function we've uh, chosen, you find that the savings rate should be equal to the profit share of the economy alpha. Because it turns out also that uh, in this case, that is a basic case, uh, uh, the basic specification used by economists, uh, alpha is the, the proportion of total output that remunerates capital. So uh, the profit share, while one minus alpha is the proportion that goes to wages. 
And so um, this, this alpha is determined by uh, the technology, it's the production function, it's uh, something um, that is given. And the savings rates, according to, to Phelps, should be equal to that, uh, so that uh, each generation can enjoy the, the maximum consumption. If you increase uh, savings above this number, you will accumulate too much capital, and so you will consume too little. Because, yeah, if you, you save more, you can consume less. Mm. But if you uh, save less than this amount, then the next generation will have not enough capital, and the next generation will, will consume too less. And, um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, let me, while, while you, you think about that, let me try to fix this camera. Uh, to check. If you have some question, it's the right moment as well. Yes? Okay, it, it moves. Um, so, what's the difference between uh, alpha and the solar residual? Like, conceptually? So, uh, it's, it's completely different. So, um, because G, the, 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 productivity, um, the productivity growth, it decreases, I mean, it is within a term that increases with, with time. Right, so, uh, but alpha, it's, uh, it's unrelated to time. So, um, alpha, it's the um, importance, the relative importance of capital with respect to labor. So, uh, so if, uh, if alpha equals um, one, then the, the labor term in the production function disappears, and uh, it means you only need capital to produce goods. Maybe in the future we'll be in such a world, there will be only robots and will be useless. Um, and in the country, if alpha goes to zero, you need only labor, you don't need any machine. And, and G, uh, exponential GT, is um, how productive one unit of labor, uh, of one hour of labor is. So if you, have, uh, if you have knowledge, and actually, okay, uh, this will be in the, in the next lecture, uh, in, the, in two lectures, uh, G, G will be reinterpreted as knowledge, basically. G, the, the exponential GT, actually. G is the rate of increase in knowledge. And, um, but yeah, because here it's weird, we don't know what is this solar residual, it comes from heaven, right? It's not explained. But, uh, but, but it's the way uh, labor uh, is, is becomes more useful over time. Uh, it becomes more efficient over time. So, so for, for the same amount of machine, for the same hour, number of hours of labor, you produce more. And this is because you have more efficient uh, management processes, you have uh, more, more knowledge so, so you can go faster, uh, use your machine in a better way. Also, capital, it's... Uh, you can think of it as like the, 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 the kiloton of steel of your machine, right? But uh, in the 21st century, with one ton of steel, you have computers. It's much more efficient than in the 18th centuries where you had like a steam machine, somehow. Okay, so it's the part, G is the part of alpha, which isn't explained by capital and labor. Like exactly, G is the... Yes, G is the, the unexplained growth, yes. Which we just assume is technology. Which, uh, which yeah, which, uh, which, which is better called productivity, actually. Productivity, but yeah, yeah. Uh, yes? Go ahead. Um, because uh, in this model, so the question is, uh, how do we know that growth is due to the technology growth? So because uh, in this model, there are only two possible uh, source of growth, which is capital accumulation, uh, so the savings, or productivity, increase in productivity, which, which you can think of as knowledge. And uh, we can 
measure the amount of uh, capital accumulation. We can measure the, the, the value of capital. I mean, this is contested, but, but Solo claimed that he could measure that. And, and, and you could also measure the growth in output, like the, 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 the figures of GDP growth. And basically, uh, to, to simplify, if, if you subtract one to the other, you obtain uh, the solo residual, the productivity growth. And, and then he showed that this term is, is huge, it's 90%. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, some papers later on showed that no, it's only just 10% because there was measurement issues, but yeah. What? Based on, based on data. Based on data, yes, yes. Yes, yes you had a question? Uh, yeah, maybe to that comment that the drop of investment would not lead to recession. So if we have a drop of investment, that would mean we are not at the, um, like, all the savings rate. And hence, we could also end up with, like, a lower level in the end, right? A lower um, steady state level. And wouldn't that be also like a recession? Maybe in a not very short term, but. Um, the thing is that um, yes, but the, the, the way the, the model is um, is used, uh, they they don't uh, go into such details. They just look at the long run, mm -hmm. and um, and also yeah. Um, the, So, okay, so uh, Solo didn't, didn't agree with uh, this feature of his model mm -hmm. that uh, investment, uh, the drop on investment would not lead to recession. He just thought that if you look at the, the evolution of, of uh, growth for like 200 years, uh, recession don't matter. So you can, you can uh, forget about recession in your model. Um, but in this model, a drop on, vis on investment um, is, uh, is actually excluded because, uh, because the, the savings rate is constant, so you don't have drop in investment. And, uh, but even if you did, um, it's, uh, it's just uh, um, a lowering of, of, uh, of savings. And if you lower savings rate in this model, it decreases the, um, the capital output ratio. But uh, it doesn't change anything to the growth rate. So it changes the level, but not the growth. And in the long run, changing the level, but not the growth, it just means like shifting by some uh, years. The, 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 you just lose some years, basically, with the recession, but uh, you will end up on the same path. Uh, there is no uh, long-term effect of recession, in some sense. Um, I'll try something, because I think they don't uh, hear your question. So. Because I haven't uh, plugged the microphone, I'll try that. Okay, now I need to do that again. Okay, please tell me in the chat if uh, if everything, if you can hear me. Ah, this camera, I don't know. Okay, they don't see me. Oh, okay. Yes. Not totally sure we are becoming more efficient with technology. <laughs> um, okay. All right. So uh, now. Uh, so 10 years later. Uh, Chalin Koopmans, who won the Nobel Prize for another reason that we'll detail in, in two lectures from now, developed his model at the same time as Cass. Actually, Cass uh, had developed the, the model before. But. And, and so the, the Cass Koopmans model um, improves on Solo's model because it uh, endogenizes the savings decision. So it's still an exogenous growth model because the growth is unexplained, it's still exogenous, but the savings decision is not necessarily constant, and it is optimized by the agent. On that, uh, it is a merge between uh, an optimization model from uh, Frank Ramsey, uh, where Ramsey had, uh, so again, an intertemporal uh, optimization of savings, 
but he had no technological progress in his model. So they, they just merged this with the progress in Solo's model. And by the way, Ramsey, uh, he was really a genius. He really uh, revolutionized the uh, math. There is like a uh, Ramsey uh, theorem and, and, and theories in math and, uh, and also economics with this paper notably and, and also philosophy. All that uh, before dying at 26. Um, so so the, the way it goes now is that um, you write the equation of the thing you want to maximize, which is the sum of uh, utility over time discounted by exponential minus uh, rho tau. It means uh, you don't care that much about uh, what will happen in 10 years from now than today, and you, will, you, will, you care even less what will happen in, in 100 years from now, perhaps because you will be dead. So, so you're, you're impatient somehow, and, uh, and so this is a weight on, on utilities that is decreasing over time. Now we have the same uh, equation of, uh, of motion as above, and uh, where C uh, is the consumption per, per worker, and uh, this is an optimization program that you can solve using a Hamiltonian, and it shows that um, there is a, a like um, it's a saddle path. There is one equilibrium that uh, if uh, a, a condition that is called no Ponzi scheme, but let's not go into the detail, is respected, we'll have a capital uh, per effective labor that converges to uh, this K star and consumption per worker that converges to uh, the, the value uh, we, we had uh, before. Um, yeah, actually, I think there is a, a mistake. It's not consumption per worker, it's consumption divided by uh, effective labor. There is a, it's inconsistent between two. Anyway, um, and, uh, and basically they, they, they show that uh, the, the economy will converge to uh, the, the golden, rooms, the, the golden room rules savings rate. All right. Um, now, let's talk about Paul Samuelson. So uh, he's really the, the father of modern economics. Um, his, his PhD became, became a foundation of economic analysis, which is a book that uh, is a general theory of uh, economic theories. So he provides in, his, in this book uh, many meaningful theorems in, that cover all fields of economics and that are never something really new, but it's a rewriting in a mathematical language of what was previously known in economics. And he systematizes this analysis by showing that uh, everything can be summarized by two principles, that some agent maximizes some uh, magnitude, and that uh, there is a stable equilibrium, or that the system converges to a stable equilibrium, and it shows that uh, these two principles are somehow equivalent. That if everybody maximizes something, then it will lead to an equilibrium, and every equilibrium can be viewed as the maximization of agents. And these two principles are really the, the principle of neoclassical economics that are used by, by, uh, by us, uh, the, the economists. And then uh, he wrote uh, a textbook that uh, became a bestseller in textbook and, uh, and uh, probably uh, launched the, 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 the textbook industry with, uh, with this textbook that, that for 50 years uh, every undergraduate student uh, used. Uh, for his contribution to econometrics, we can cite uh, revealed preferences. So the idea here is to how to measure the utility function. So one way would be uh, to, to ask people uh, about their utility function, but people can lie or cannot know. And um, what Samuelson introduced and convinced the other to do is to infer the utility of people or their preferences from the choices they make that we can observe. And it provides techniques to analyze the data to extract 
underlying utility function that could explain such data. Then uh, he provided uh, mathematical condition for the efficient provision of public goods, but I will cover this in another lecture. He popularized the overlapping generation models. So if you look at the, the models, which is here, the, there is no generation. It's like uh, at every period there is uh, some representative agent that has uh, some consumption and saving. And um, it, it, it has some limitation, this model. It's very simplified. And um, the, an alternative is to have uh, overlapping generation. That is, at each period, there are young people and old people. Uh, and each generation lives for two periods. And so they overlap. And it changes uh, the, 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 the way. And, and yeah, and the young people work. Uh, the old people and, and save for retirement, the old people dissave and don't work. Uh, it's, it's, it's become very used uh, in many... Uh, yeah. Then he also uh, worked on uh, international economics, um, so trade and so on, and uh, with uh, Balassa, he, he coined the Balassa simulation effect. That is an explanation why prices are, are higher in rich countries. So the idea is that there are two kinds of goods. Traded goods, like computers, that are, uh, in theory, they, they, they should have the same price uh, everywhere on Earth, because uh, most of the cost of this good is the production cost, and then uh, and not the retail cost. So uh, if, it was, if it didn't have the same price everywhere on Earth, there would be a profit to make by uh, buying it where it's cheap and selling it where it's expensive. But non-traded goods are not the same. Like, uh, you cannot uh, buy a haircut in uh, China, although it's cheaper than here. So non-traded goods are goods that are basically localized, like service goods, like services. And uh, the reason rich countries are rich is because uh, they have uh, more capital or more uh, efficient uh, technologies, that is more knowledge somehow, um, and uh, at least according to this model. And this is why they are uh, able to, to produce uh, types of goods, like uh, think of airplanes that are produced mainly in Europe and the US, not in Africa. Uh, while poor countries cannot produce these goods. Another way to... to, to f yeah, I think maybe airplanes is not the best ex example because precisely they're not produced in Africa. But think about rice. Okay? Uh, in, in Africa, you probably need uh, 10 times more workers to produce one kilo of rice than uh, in, in France. In Switzerland, I'm not sure you produce rice. But uh, why? Because... Um, because uh, in France you have uh, machines, you have uh, agronomes, uh, etc. And so it means that uh, because the rice is a traded good, there's the same price in Africa or in, or in France, um, then the, the salary of workers will be 10 times lower in Africa because you need 10 times more workers. And also because there are barriers to, migra to migration, uh, African can uh, not uh, easily migrate to Europe. Uh, you have separate labor markets. And within a labor market, wage, wages should be equalized. So basically, all, to simplify, all French have the same wage, all African have the same wage. And, uh, and so the, the wage in the, the, the agricultural sector in Africa um, spill over the wage in the haircut uh, sector or whatever service. Although uh, French people are not better at uh, doing haircut than Africans, uh, haircuts are more expensive in uh, France because the wages of, uh, agricul of uh, agriculture are, uh, more ex are higher in France than in Africa. Was it clear? So, yeah. So, so yes, the, the, the old prices, the, the prices of, of non-traded goods are, are higher, and, and so the, the overall prices. And there is also the Stolper-Samuelson theorem, 
uh, which uh, is a result about a trade uh, model, the extra all-in model, which is the basic trade model that uh, builds on the, the, the theory of comparative advantage of uh, Adam Smith and Ricardo, that uh, this theory says what, what do countries trade? Because one country is good at uh, producing, let's say, uh, chocolate, that's Switzerland, and uh, what country is, for, is good at producing uh, French fries, that's Belgium, and so uh, Belgium will sell fries and uh, Switzerland will sell chocolate. And, um, okay, perhaps it was not a good example, let's say fries against uh, watches. Okay, you have uh, one good that is uh, intensive in capital, that is watches, you need a lot of machines to produce a watch, uh, and one good that is uh, intensive in labor, that is the French fries. And what this theorem says is that if the price of uh, French fries rises, the price of the labor intensive good, then the production, uh, the, the factor of production used for this good, so labor, will rise uh, relative to, uh, to, to capital, to the price of capital, to the price of capital. Okay, uh, that, that was it for, for this lecture. Um, I can take question, and if there is no question, I'll jump to the next uh, topic. Are there questions? Okay, so until now, we've um, talked about uh, Keynesian economists. So economists that, uh, broadly speaking, think that uh, government intervention can be a good thing for the economy because there are markets in perfection and there are many uh, ways in which the government can improve upon a situation of laissez-faire where market forces are set free. In this lecture, I'll cover economists that think the contrary. So we can tell that we can qualify them as libertarians, that is their ideological position. And then there are two uh, macroeconomic school of thought, monetarism and uh, new classical. Um, but all these economists, or most of the economists that I will cover in this lecture, uh, are from the Chicago school. So these are economists that were at some, time, some point of their career in the University of Chicago which uh, was and still is the, the center uh, of this, this type of, of thought, uh, libertarianism and in economics, basically, and free, free markets, etc. Okay, so um, I'll start with classical liberals. So these are the so liberals from, from the, the, the early uh, 20th century. And in particular, the, the Austrian school. So the Austrian school, so uh, of course, it emerged in Vienna, and uh, it made many, con like some, some important contributions to, to economics as we know it. The founder of uh, the Austrian school, school was Karl Menger, and he introduced marginalism, which is uh, basically the idea of utility function somehow, which is the idea that values are determined by the significance of the, the value of the last unit added, right? So the, the wage is the value of the marginal unit of labor. The return to capital is the value uh, and the cost of the marginal unit of capital, etc. cetera. Uh, this, um, so Morgan Stern was, uh, was also uh, an Austrian and, uh, and, um, and he pushed this, uh, this idea to the, to the full, uh, fully blown uh, formalization in the 50s and we'll cover that uh, in two lectures. Then there is uh, Van Wieser who introduced the important notion of opportunity cost. Does someone know what, is, what does it mean, opportunity cost? So it's a, it's a central idea in economics. It means that well, you, you, the, 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 the cost that matters when uh, you think about something is not really the cost of the thing itself, but is the cost of the best alternative that you would have 
chosen if this option was not available. So for example, if uh, you, you want to, to go to, to a concert, but the same day there is a party, then uh, you choose to go to the concert. But the opportunity cost is the pleasure you would have had to go to the party. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a value that, uh, that is lost to you, and this is uh, the cost of the opportunity you missed. And this is uh, really what matters. Um, okay. Then there is Bom Beverk, uh, Bom Beverk, uh, who said that, um, yeah, so th there is a, um, a methodology uh, of individualism in this uh, school of thought. That is, uh, they reduce everything to labor and time, and actually to individuals. So uh, they view uh, the individuals as the indivisible unit of decision, and uh, as opposed to institutionalists who view institutions like the state in an organic way that cannot be uh, easily explained uh, by the interactions among individuals. And so you should have uh, the state as a, an actor, an agent per se. And you should study the state as um, uh, an institution uh, with its own norm, uh, its own uh, logic of action, uh, etc. For Austrian, it's not the case. We can all reduce to individuals. And uh, investment in this uh, way of thought is just, uh, or, or actually good, is just labor, okay? Uh, and the labor that was uh, used to produce the machines uh, that were used to produce these goods, and the labor that uh, were used to produce the machine to produce the machines, etc. And so investment, the machines, is just deferred production. It's a production that occurred at a time uh, earlier than, than production of the good itself. And uh, when you, you pursue this idea, then um, impatience, time preference, the, the coefficient rho in the, the equation of earlier. So the, the way you, you value uh, next period with respect to the current period, this di dictates the interest rate. Because if you really don't care about the future, you will ask me a very high interest rate to uh, give me some money in exchange uh, that I, I uh, give it back to you uh, next year with interest. And this is, according to them, this availability of savings that uh, pays for investment and which is dictated by the time preferences of people, so their impatience. So the more patient they are, the more willing they are to consume less, save, save more, the lower will be the interest rate and the higher will be uh, capital accumulation. And uh, the idea I will expand upon is uh, today is um, an idea from von Mises, uh, Ludwig von Mises, that was uh, uh, retaken by uh, Friedrich von Hayek, which is the superiority of uh, the market to organize production with respect to central planning. So remember that we're in the 20s, 30s, and so there was a counter model to uh, the market economy, which was central planning of the Soviet Union. And um, Van Mises uh, argued that uh, there is an economic calculation problem with central planning, because everything is owned, uh, every, cap every uh, means of production, so every machine, every plant is owned by the same uh, actor, which is the state, then there will not be a price for capital goods. There will not be a market for, for machines because no one will buy them. The, the, the ones who produce them is the, the same as the one who buys them. And because there isn't a price, then uh, the, the planner, the central planner, cannot really know the, the true value of these goods and may make mistakes in the plan 
when they, they compute uh, how much machines should we produce, uh, how should we allocate them, etc. The idea is that when you let the market decide, some people will exploit the opportunity of, uh, of, uh, of reducing cost, of uh, buying some, something cheaper, selling it uh, more expensive, etc., so that um, you will reach efficiency. The, the, the prices will reflect the values of the goods, they will be allocated to the people who most need them, uh, etc. There are other ideas in the Austrian schools that were dismissed uh, because they lacked of uh, empirical ground and were considered as not scientific. So first is their methodology. So they, they really dismiss uh, mathematics and data. And they think that uh, we, we should uh, attain uh, the knowledge in economics through introspection. So through a logical understanding of how things work. And uh, the problem with this methodology is that uh, their theory of the business cycle was invalidated by the data and they didn't really care. So uh, this theory uh, is, is, uh, can make sense when we look at it. It says that uh, the, the fractional reserve banking system which is the system that is used for banking in nowadays, um, where you have a central bank and a regulator that is the lender of last resort to commercial banks. And agents in the economy, they face commercial banks, not the central bank directly. And a bank can extend credit even if it has uh, no uh, assets in there. It's not like the, the bank has a, a big coffer uh, with, with, uh, with gold and when someone wants a loan, they give one bar of, of gold and, uh, and ask for it uh, <clears throat> one year uh, later. And when there is no gold, they cannot uh, lend anymore. It's not like that. They can uh, create money uh, when uh, they, they decide to create credit to, to, to accept a loan, they create money uh, by the same time, they create credit. And uh, both their assets, so the thing they own, in this case the loan itself, they, they own uh, the money in one year from now that the person has to pay back, grows at the same time as their uh, liability, uh, which is the, the, the money they created and uh, which uh, they are um, liable to um, the, 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 per the person they, they gave it to. So, um, yeah. So basically, when, when, you, when you deposit uh, money in your, in your bank account, it's, uh, it's your asset, but it's a liability of the bank. Because it means that uh, if you ask for it, the banks has to give it to you back. Okay, and uh, what does fractional means? It means that um, the bank still has to have some assets of the special nature that are reserved to the central bank. And so these reserves are uh, the, the only true euro that are um, <coughs> But that is provided by the central bank. And the fractional reserve system uh, means that the bank cannot extend credit more than a multiple of these uh, reserves. So let's say they, they need to have at least one tenth of uh, all the credits uh, they give in reserves of the central bank. This means this, it constrains them to have uh, some uh, true uh, assets that they cannot uh, lend, they, they have to keep them in their, uh, in their coffer instead of, um, yeah, instead of being, being able to, yeah, I don't know to explain this, but um, yeah, they, they need to have uh, only one fraction of uh, all what uh, they, they landed uh, in their coffer, basically, and, 
and the lower this fraction is, the, the higher the leverage they have, and the riskier it is. Because if there is a, a bank run, everyone's, uh, everyone wants uh, uh, their money back at the same time, and they only have one-tenth of it in reserve, uh, then it's bankruptcy. So, yes? Uh, what, is, what is the fraction, typically? It's around one-tenth, but I'm not sure. Uh, it's between 5% to 15%. Uh, it depends on countries. Uh, not, I don't know the exact number. And actually, nowadays it's uh, it's more complicated than what I just explained. You have actually you have two uh, different ratio. You have the uh, liability over reserves ratio, which is what I've talked about. But you also have the asset over uh, capital ratio. And you have, um, I mean, the, the the regulator also takes into account the the, the, the riskiness of the of the credit you provide, etc. But uh, more or less, it's 10%, to give you a rough idea. And so, what the Austrian school says is that this generates too much credit, credit because in their view, uh, we should not uh, be, uh, it's not that we should not be allowed to do what banks do, but, um, okay, the, the counterpart of the constraint, uh, of this constraint on banks, um, is that they have a banking license, so they have an official recognition from the central bank and the state, which ensures the deposit. Which means that in case of bank run, if the bank cannot uh, give the money that people want to withdraw, the state will intervene and provides this money, at least up to a certain extent, maybe 100k uh, per, per person. And um, this, this uh, for the Austrian, uh, is a very bad idea because uh, this insurance that the states provide is an incentive for banks to uh, engage in too risky operations. And so they will extend too much credit. They will provide uh, loans at too low an interest rate as compared to the situation where only uh, the savings of people uh, could be used to fund loans. Then the interest rate would be much higher than if we can uh, extend credit uh, by just uh, uh, yeah, creating money. And so this uh, easy money creation generates uh, booms of what uh, they call malinvestment. So because credit is so easily uh, given, it is given to projects that are bad, uh, which are mal investments. And uh, after some years, uh, we noticed that these projects are bad. Uh, they, they cannot uh, succeed in selling the goods they, they produced. And uh, they cannot pay back the loans. And so uh, banks uh, restrict uh, the credit to, to not, uh, to, to, because because basically the, the, the bank uh, suffers a loss if people don't pay back. So, so their reserves decrease, so they cannot uh, lend as much. And it's, uh, so it's uh, booms and uh, like bubbles and, and bust. And uh, in the, 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 the bursting uh, of the cycle, the capital reallocates uh, from the firms that go bankrupt to the others uh, so that um, we liquidate the, the bad projects and uh, we fund again the, work, the projects that work. Okay, so this is uh, basically classical liberalism. The, I mean, this part of classical liberalism, which uh, we could call libertarian uh, nowadays because uh, liberalism now, uh, in the US at least, means the progressive, which is uh, totally the, like the opposite meaning as, uh, I mean, not the opposite, but it's different meaning as libertarian. So libertarianism can be summarized uh, with two, uh, th that society should rely only on two principles. Um, the principle of uh, non-aggression, it means that uh, the, the state should make sure to punish those who um, kill someone, who, who hurt someone uh, physically or uh, end private property. 
the state should uh, punish the thieves and protect private property. And basically, that's it. The state should not do more than that. So uh, Friedrich von Hayek uh, founded the Mont, Mont Pelerin uh, Society in Montreux, actually, not far from here, in 47. And uh, many of, uh, so it's a, it's a small association of, uh, of libertarian um, which use this uh, platform to uh, elaborate and defend their ideas in favor of private property and against uh, the expansion of the state. Hayek wrote an influential book that was a bestseller, The Road to Serfdom, where he warns against the dangers of central planning. So again, at that time, in 1944, uh, the, the US were using central planning for the war effort, and all, all major power were using this, but the one who were using it the most, of course, was the Soviet Union, because uh, central planning was uh, covering all the economy there. And uh, Hayek said, okay, you socialists, the, the book is dedicated to socialists. He says, you have good intentions but, uh, because you want uh, the, the good of people, but um, you're mistaken. And the central planning uh, you propose is a slippery slope to uh, authoritarian regimes like the, the Nazis, and it's no wonder that uh, you obtain uh, Stalinism in, in the Soviet Union. Why? Okay, first, from uh, an economic point of view, because of the economic calculation problem, uh, I explain uh, central planning is not efficient. The, the, the planner doesn't have the capacity to take good decisions for the entire society, and I will explain that in the next slide. Um, but more insidiously, Central planning infantilizes people because uh, they cannot make their own choice. So it takes up their freedom. People uh, get accustomed to that. They, they do not fight for their freedom. And uh, it leads to tyranny and oppression. And he concluded that uh, competition is the only method by which our activities can be adjusted to each other without coercive or arbitrary intervention of authority. Okay, so um, do you want the pose right now? Or maybe I finish with Hayek and, and then the pose? Okay, so um, this is a very nice paper uh, from uh, Hayek, The Use of Knowledge in Society. So I'm going to quote it extensively. And uh, I think I won't have to explain it uh, uh, too much like I did for Keynes because this is quite uh, self-explanatory. The problem of a rational economic order is determined precisely, so yeah, he's, he's asking the question, uh, how should we devise the rules for society uh, to have a, an economic order that is rational, that is. Uh, so the, the problem of rational economic order is determined precisely by the fact that the knowledge of the circumstances of which we must make use never exist in concentrated or integrated form but solely as the dispersed bits of incomplete and frequently contradictory knowledge which all the separate individuals possess. This question is closely connected with that other question which arises here, that of who is to do the planning. It is a dispute because, yeah, because he says that uh, we do planning, every economic decision is planning. When, uh, when a manager in a firm decides uh, uh, whatever, uh, they plan something. We all plan. But the question is, uh, do we have central planning by uh, a higher authority, the state, or do we let the planning uh, to every individual? It is a dispute as to whether planning is to be done centrally by one authority for the whole economic system, or is it to be divided among many individuals? Practically every individual has some advantage over all others in that he possesses unique information of which beneficial use might be made, but of which use can be made only if the decisions depending on it are left to him or are made with his active cooperation. 
It would seem to follow that the ultimate decisions must be left to the people who are familiar with these circumstances, who know directly of the relevant changes and of the resources immediately available to meet them. All that is significant for him is how much more or less difficult to procure this resource have become compared with other. This problem can be solved and in fact is being solved by the price system. Prices can act to coordinate the separate actions of different people. So here, yeah, we must look at the price system as such a mechanism for communicating information, which of course it fulfills less perfectly as prices grow more rigid. So here he says that uh, to decide the relevant economic question to you, that is how much should I produce of this good if you're a manager, or how much should I buy of this good if you're a consumer, you don't need to know uh, if um, the price of wood became more expensive in Indonesia. Although this can have an impact on your decision, because if the price of wood becomes more expensive, then so does uh, the, the price of uh, um, how do we say English? of tires, I don't know, that are produced in Indonesia, and then so does uh, the transportation cost and so on, and then it raises the price of your good, and your good is less available. But you don't need to know why your good has become more expensive or less available to take your decision. And the idea is the price conveys all the information you need to convey this decision, and it naturally emerges from the interaction of many, many people. And then he said that um, it's no wonder that um, it, that is uh, that way. It's an evolutionary process. And, uh, and that's why people don't recon the, don't acknowledge the importance and the, the, the miracle of the price system. It's because it, it wasn't invented by human. It's just a product of evolution. We, we, we ended up in this system because it works well. And, uh, and says that's why people don't understand uh, how, how it works and the importance of it. And uh, it says, we make constant use of rules whose meaning we don't understand. We have developed these practices and institutions by building upon habits and institutions which have proven successful in their own sphere and which have in turn become the foundation of the civilization we have built up. So here it's really uh, a defense of uh, letting the, the forces uh, naturally evolve and uh, the, the good thing will remain uh, through the process of evolution. And um, yeah. And so the, when, when I'm reading this text, uh, I cannot help but um, but seeing uh, a strong argument in favor of democracy. Because if you replace prices by uh, collective decision making, you could have the same meaning. Meaning that uh, to take decisions, we need information from, from everyone in society to, to take the good decisions. And uh, one head of state cannot possess all the relevant information. So it's useful to ask people all the, the relevant uh, information or uh, to summarize the, the, the choice that they would make in a situation. But uh, Hayek was not uh, really in favor of, of democracy. He was not uh, opposed to it, uh, maybe, but, but he was very wary of the state. Um, so, so for him, it wasn't a, a defense of democracy, but that's, that's the way uh, I read it, that uh, we should take uh, the information from uh, every places where they are relevant, so everyone should have their say in the decision process. Okay, thank you. You can take your pose or ask questions. And um, yeah. uh, I don't know, five minutes, ten minutes? <laughs> I don't know what you 
what you want. For me, the short rest is the best. But. So there is a question in the chat, if Hayek was not in favor of democracy, what was he in favor of? Um, I think he was maybe in favor of a, of a democratic regime that, was, that, that would be libertarian. So, so democracy that uh, has a very few, um, so, so a kind of anarchy, if you if you want. So so a, a state that has uh, very few uh, competences. So competence in uh, protecting private property, in protecting people from crime, uh, and and that's basically it. And actually, he wrote he wrote a book that maybe I'm uh, because I I don't know this very well. Maybe he viewed uh, other roles for the government. Uh, he, he wrote a, a book on this. Um, which uh, can give you the name, and uh, to, because that was the, the because Keynes read the, the, the book the road the road to serfdom, and uh, and he said uh, yes I basically agree with you uh, Friedrich, but uh, all what you say in the book is is correct. But the thing is, uh, in the book you 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 acknowledge uh, some role for the government uh, in, in some circumstances. But uh, you don't dis explain uh, in which cases it will be uh, like what is the frontier, and maybe I'm uh, I have a, a wrong conception of uh, the frontier he places. What I'm telling you is just the the, the frontier of libertarian, of extreme libertarian. But maybe it was more subtle than that. And he came up with a book uh, 20 years later uh, where he explained what this frontier was, and uh, Margaret Thatcher. Uh, once uh, said uh, in, a, in a meeting that um, the, she, she showed the, the Hayek's book and she said, this is what we believe in. So, so probably uh, looking at, uh, yeah, so basically she agreed with um, the competences of government uh, that uh, Hayek thought was needed. Um, Yeah, okay, so in the, road, in the road to serfdom, he acknowledges an extensive role for the government, actually. Prohibition, limit of working hours, protecting the environment, social safety net, social insurance. Ah, no, sorry, no, I'm confusing with, uh, yeah, no, no, that's it, that's it, yeah. But, yeah, but in the, yeah, but in the later edition, uh, he defends a much more libertarian stance. So it's because in the road to serfdom, it's uh, only um, objective was to destroy central planning. So, uh, so for the purpose of his demonstration, he agreed to, to let a quite sizable role for government, but, but actually uh, maybe it was not uh, the way, the, the views he expressed uh, in other moments. Okay, and now that uh, you know uh, a bit about Keynes and Hayek, I recommend you this uh, epic rap battle. There are two episodes. Lord Keynes, welcome, sir. It's a pleasure. The pleasure's all mine. Your agenda. That won't be necessary. I am the agenda. <laughs> tell them I've arrived. And then tell them I've arrived. And your name is... Hayek? F. A. Hayek? What an angel. Freddy. Hey, listen, party at the Fed. Already? 20 minutes. 
Lobby. John Maynard Keynes. Oh, F.A. Hayek. Yeah, yeah, we're opposed. We oppose each other philosophically in the same studio. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. Play more well interest no. rates. It's the animal spirits. John Maynard Keynes wrote the book on modern macro. The man you need when the economy's off track. Depression, recession, now your question's in session. Have a seat and I'll school you in one simple lesson. Boom, 1929, the big crash. We didn't bounce back, economies in the trash. Persistent unemployment, the result of sticky wages. Waiting for recovery, Seriously? that's outrageous. I had a real plan, any fool can understand. The advice, real simple, boost aggregate demand. C, I, G, all together gets to Y. Keep that total grow and watch the economy fly. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. Play low interest no, rates. It's the animal spirit. You see, it's all about spending. Hear the register cha-ching. Circular flow, the dough is everything. So if that flow is getting low, doesn't matter the reason. We need more government spending. Now it's stimulus season. So forget about saving. Get it straight out of your head. Like I said, in the long run, we're all dead. Savings is destruction. That's the paradox of thrift. Don't keep money in your pocket or that growth will never lift. Because business is driven by the animal Animal spirits, the bull and the bear, and there's reasons to fear its effects on capital investment, income, and growth. That's why the state should fill the gap with stimulus, both the monetary and the fiscal. They're equally correct. Public works, digging ditches, war has the same effect. Even a broken window helps the glass man have some wealth. The multiplier driving higher the economy's health. And if the central bank's interest rate policy tanks, a liquidity trap, that new money stuck in the banks. Deficits could be the cure you've been looking for. Let the spending soar now that you know the score. My general theories made quite an impression. Revolution. I transformed the econ profession. You know me, modesty. Still, I'm taking a bow. So say it loud and say it proud. We're all Keynesians now. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. I've made my case, Freddie H. Listen up, can you hear it? I'll begin in broad strokes, just like my friend Keynes. His theory conceals the mechanics to change. That simple equation, too much aggregation. Ignores human action and motivation Yet it continues as a justification For bailouts, payoffs, by polls with machinations You provide them with cover to sell us a free lunch Then all that we're left with is debt and a bunch If you're living high on that cheap credit hog Don't look for a cure from the hair of the dog Real savings come first if you want to invest The market coordinates time with interest Your focus on spending is pushing on thread In the long run, my friend, it's your theory that's dead So sorry there, buddy, if that sounds like invective Prepare to get schooled in my Austrian perspective We've been going back and forth for a century I want to steer markets I want them set free There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it Play low well interest no, rates it's the animal spirit The place you should study isn't the bust It's the boom that should make you feel leery that's the thrust of my theory. The capital structure is key. Malinvestments wreck the economy. The boom gets started with an expansion of credit. The Fed sets rates low. Are you starting to get it? That new money is confused for real loanable funds. But it's just inflation that's driving the ones who invest in new projects like housing construction. The boom plants the seeds for its future destruction. The savings aren't real. Consumption's up too. And the grasping for resources reveals there's too few. So the boom turns to bust. As the interest rates rise For the cost of production Price signals were lies The boom was a binge That's a matter of fact Now it's devalued capital That makes up the slack Whether it's the late 20s or 2005 Booming bad investments Seems like they'd thrive You must save to invest Don't use the printing press Or a bus will surely follow An economy depressed Your so-called stimulus Will make things worse Just more of the same More incentives perverse And that credit crunch Ain't a liquidity trap Just a broke Banking system, I'm done, that's a wrap We've been going back and forth for a century I want to steer markets I want them set free There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it Play more interest no, rates It's the animal spirit The ideas of economists and political philosophers Both when they are right and when they are wrong Are more powerful than is commonly understood Indeed, the world is ruled by little else Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. The 
glorious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. They've been going back and forth for a century. For a century. <laughs> um, okay, now let's turn to Milton Friedman and monetarism. Ah, yeah, sorry for the quality. You can find it on YouTube. Um, it's an epic rap battle. Um, so, Milton Friedman is the major figure of the Chicago school and a famous advocate of uh, liberalism. He was uh, very well known and popular at the time. He's not only an academic, but he was also very present in the public debate in the US. Uh, his book Capitalism and Freedom had a deep influence. And he had a weekly column in Newsweek for 20 years in the, between 66 and 84. Um, yeah, so, uh, at the time, there was no uh, flexibility in exchange rates. So uh, before the Second World War, it was um, the gold standard. So every currency had a fixed price in gold, uh, a fixed exchange rate uh, with gold. And uh, after um, the Bretton Woods uh, Agreement in '44, uh, all monies could at the fixed exchange rate with the dollar, and uh, the dollar was convertible into gold at a fixed uh, rate as well. And for him, fixing the exchange rate is an unnecessary uh, involvement of the government. And so uh, he made the case for flexible exchange rate. Uh, at the time, it was thought unrealistic, but the future gave, gave him reason now, uh, most countries, mo most big economies at least, not all countries, but use a flexible exchange rate. For example, between uh, the euro, the dollar, the franc, and the yen, uh, it's flexible exchange rate. Um, and for, yeah, some other have a mixed regime. For example, for the renminbi in, in China, it's, uh, it's flexible within, within limits. Um, okay. Um, his first important contribution was uh, for the theory of the consumer. So he made a, an hypothesis which is very uh, close to the one from Modigliani, I don't know if you remember. Uh, so it's the permanent income hypothesis that says that consumption of an individual is smooth around um, over time. So the individual takes into account their future expected income and uh, consume uh, a level uh, corresponding to uh, this permanent income. So, uh, so more than their current income, their absolute income when they're a student, and, um, and less than this uh, when they're, they are grown up. So this is uh, one part of, um, of, his, of his theory. Another is um, to show that um, the, the liquidity preference uh, that, that Keynes thought about is not true. So for Keynes, the demand for money uh, is, varies. It varies with the interest rate and, uh, and uh, yeah, it varies uh, in the interest rate. And, um, and for, for, for Friedman, so the reason it varies with the interest rate is because you, you want um, more money when the interest rate is low because uh, the, the, the gain you would have by owning a bond instead uh, is quite low. But for Friedman, you shouldn't take only into account the government obligation uh, to, to do this uh, rezoning, but every kind of asset. So uh, stocks, uh, every kind of bonds, every kind of financial contracts, and this will make the demand for money much more stable and uh, much less uh, vari vari varying in function of the interest rate. Another key thing for, for uh, Friedman is that uh, the velocity of money 
is stable, according to him. And uh, for him, it's an empirical fact. When he looked at the data before him, uh, this magnitude uh, was observed to be stable. So what is the velocity of money? It's the ratio between, so the, the total amount of transaction Y in a given year multiplied by the price of this transaction, so the money that has been transfer, transferred in one year, divided by the money supply M. So basically it's the number of time one, one bill or one coin changes of hand uh, every year. And if this number, if this velocity is constant, then you obtain the quantity theory of money that prices are directly proportional to money supply M because the amount of transactions don't vary a lot from year to year, the GDP. And so uh, if the quantity of money determines directly proportionally the prices, then inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. So for Friedman, inflation is not determined, for example, by the bargaining power of uh, workers with respect to firms, is determined by the quantity of money, or the, the growth in the money supply. Now, so these are, um, yeah, this is a key tenet of monetarism. This is what gave the, the name to this theory, is the quantity theory of money. And we can trace it back to David Hume in the 18th century. Uh, that uh, it's, it's a basic idea if, uh, if you double the, um, if I double the, 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 the quantity of, uh, of franc that uh, each of us and each one in the economy has in their bank account, then logically all prices should double and it should change absolutely nothing to the economy. So um, with this uh, hypothesis, um, he, he thinks that um, fiscal policy does not work. So um, fiscal policy, uh, you remember, is uh, when uh, the government uh, increased the deficit to, to, to stimulate investment. And so uh, for Friedman, um, it, uh, only, only the monetary policy work. And, um, yeah, sorry, I'm just looking something. Um, because the reason why the, um, the fiscal policy doesn't work is it has only a uh, transitory effect because uh, you may surprise people with increased investment but uh, in the end, um, you will go back to the, the stable equilibrium of uh, free markets. But he acknowledges that uh, monetary policy can work. That is, when you increase the money supply in the next unexpected, unanticipated way, then people will think that uh, they are richer, so uh, they, they will consume more, um, they, they will, the, the employers will hire more. Uh, so it will stimulate uh, the economy, but uh, only in a transitory, transitory, transitory way. Then people will understand um, that uh, it was just an increase in the money supply and not an increase in income. And so uh, the policy that uh, Friedman recommends is the monetary policy is a constant growth in the money supply. So it's basically no monetary policy at all. The government the, or the central bank should not try to stimulate the economy by injecting liquidity in, term, in times of a recession or should not, because actually, yeah, or, or should not try to, to slow down the economy in times of booms. It should just commit to have a constant uh, money supply growth equal to the output growth uh, so that um, prices are stable and, um, 
and you can have uh, cycles, you can have uh, recessions and, uh, and booms, but uh, it would only make things worse if the states intervene. Because even if you think that uh, monetary policy uh, could be useful in the short run, policy is prone to political capture by vested interests, by lobbies, and, uh, and it, has, it has only transitory effects. So the, um, the problem associated with the discretionary policies outweigh uh, the cost. And um, yeah, and sorry. And another way why uh, fiscal policy will not work that that well is because of the permanent income hypothesis. So if you increase the income of someone transitorily, it will not really affect their permanent income. And because their consumption level depends on their permanent income, it will not really affect uh, consumption. So uh, he claimed empirical support for monetarism. And uh, this theory became accepted during the, the 70s, in a time where we had, at the same time, inflation and uh, a stagnating economy. So no growth, uh, high unemployment. And this is called uh, the stagflation, for stagnation inflation. And this cannot be really explained by Keynesian economies, by Keynesian theory. At least this is, this is what uh, Friedman claims. Because for Keynesian, when you have inflation, it, uh, it reduces um, unemployment. So you cannot have unemployment and inflation at the same time. What Keynesian answer to that is that uh, the reason for inflation at that period uh, was external. It was due to uh, rising oil prices uh, following the, the, the decision of OPEC that uh, spilled over oil prices. But, uh, but Friedman uh, had a legitimate point. And actually, his work with uh, Anna Schwartz, um, A Military History of the US, is a very detailed account. So Anna Schwartz was a historian, uh, economist historian, and, and uh, he provided more the theory part. And, and, uh, and both of them, they explored in detail uh, the history of banking, central banking, uh, financial markets in the US over one century. Um, and they argue, somewhat convincingly, that uh, the Great Depression was due to monetary mistakes, to most mistakes uh, by the central bank, the Fed. The Fed provided too low rates in the 20s. This is what we saw in the video, what Hayek was saying. So too easy credits that created a boom. And in the 30s, uh, too high rates of interest, so that uh, because um, they should have lowered the rate uh, of interest in this way, in this sense, he has uh, the same uh, view as Keynes um, to stimulate the economy. But they did so too late. Only in uh, 1934 did the government say, "Okay, we will uh, insure the deposits," and uh, this ended. Uh, the bank run, actually, and, uh, and uh, this ended a long series of bankruptcies in the US, but it was a five years long due. And Friedman argued that, okay, maybe uh, stimulating, so lowering in the interest rate after the crisis uh, has uh, emerged, it was a good thing to do, and it was done too, too late. But the, the, the better things to do would have been not to have a low rate in the 20s, but to have a constant growth in uh, the money supply, uh, and, uh, and, and to have a, yeah, lower growth in the money supply that, uh, that what we had in the 20s, so less uh, credit, uh, less easy uh, conditions. The problem with this theory is that it was invalidated by uh, data in the 80s, so one decade after it was uh, formulated. Because then we noticed that the velocity of money is not stable, actually. It varies over time. And we noticed that the money supply uh, is not a good predictor of inflation. There are episodes of inflation uh, that uh, do not come from a uh, growth in the money supply and vice versa. So not only uh, the hypothesis of the theory 
uh, turned out to be wrong, but also the policy recommendation turned out to, to be quite bad ideas. So the, the chairman of the Fed, the central bank of the US, Paul Volcker, was a monetarist and tried uh, Friedman's policy between 79 and 82 with the constant growth of the money supply and uh, it just uh, aggravated the recession of these years. And then, despite uh, Friedman's repeated warning in the, in the press, uh, the Fed abandoned this policy and so they successfully uh, decreased the rest of interest to stimulate the economy without uh, creating inflation and then it successfully increased the rate of interest of the, of the economy when, uh, when the, the recession was over without uh, creating unemployment. So, so yeah. Friedman also contributed to uh, the idea of the natural right of unemployment. So an important curve in economics is the Phillips curve. It's um, an empirical relationship that was observed by uh, Phillips in uh, 58. This is the, the, the curve taken from the original paper of Phillips you can see unemployment on the x-axis and uh, the increase in uh, nominal wages in the y-axis. You know what nominal uh, is? So money, nominal wage is uh, the, the, the dollar amount of the wage uh, as opposed to the real wage which is corrected for inflation. So the, the real wage in the US in the in the 50s, it was maybe, I don't know, uh, $200 per, per month. But uh, the real wage, if we, if we put it in, in uh, the, the dollar value of today, it was maybe uh, 1,000. Okay. And so, um, Philips was actually uh, not, uh, not so convinced by, uh, by his curve, uh, but uh, he was uh, pushed to publish it by, by the editor uh, of a journal and uh, it became uh, really famous. Why? Because uh, in Keynesian economics, so th it relied on uh, the ISLM model that assumes fixed price. And there was uh, an, equa an equation was lacking uh, about the prices, how do price varies. So Phillips provided the equation that relates real variables, so the unemployment, and uh, monetary variables nominal variables like uh, wages or inflation. Why inflation? Because um, actually after Phillips, economists uh, changed this curve and replaced uh, the increase in nominal wage by just inflation, so the increase in prices in general. And Phillips uh, didn't think uh, we, could do th we could actually do that uh, and was not happy with the, the way uh, the, the research on the Phillips curve was advancing and, and changed completely uh, of topic. He, he became disinterested into that. But uh, nonetheless, this, this uh, Phillips curve became uh, very important. So uh, this curve, as you see, it's an inverse relationship between wages and unemployment. And why? So maybe I already explained that. But um, the explanation that, that came uh, first into mind is the, the bargaining power between workers and wages and uh, employers. So when employment rises, workers have more bargaining power because employers cannot easily uh, say, uh, look, uh, you ask for a, a, an increase in your wage. I, don't, I will not uh, give it to you because there are hundreds of people waiting for a job, so if you're not satisfied, you can leave. There is full employment, they cannot say that, so they have to accept the increase in wages. And uh, Samuelson and, and Solo interpreted this curve as a menu of options between employment and inflation. So basically the government has a choice of having low unemployment with uh, high inflation or high unemployment with low inflation. And uh, yeah, this is a trade-off. But uh, Friedman disagreed. And in his uh, address uh, to the Association of uh, 
American Association, American Economic Association. He was the president in 68, and there is, uh, every year when there is a new president, they make a speech, and the, the speech of Friedman is memorable, because he pointed out two deficiencies with uh, the theory. The first is the focus on nominal values instead of uh, real values. So why would workers ask for an increase in the nominal wage? What matters is the real wage, is the number of, uh, is the, the, of the amount of pasta they can buy with their wage. It's not the, the value of their wage uh, only. So they should take into account uh, the, 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 the prices as well. So, so you could not easily replace, um, I mean, what we should have is a relation between employment and, uh, and the real wage, if it was uh, a question of bargaining power, not, not with uh, the money wage. And the second uh, problem is that uh, it forgets expectations. And why? We'll see why. Friedman proposes another story. In his story, there is an asymmetry of information between employers and employees. So workers expect future wages to be equal to past wages. They have what we call adaptive expectation. So they expect the future to be like the past. You know, or maybe they, like the, they, they expect the future evolution to be like the past evolution. Which, uh, which is a form of rationality somehow. Um, the thing is that uh, employers, firms have better information of how uh, prices uh, vary and uh, they know before the, the workers that there will be inflation, for example. And so they are more able to adjust the, adjust the price of the good they sell in case of inflation. And uh, so, so they will increase the price of the goods while they don't have to increase the wages because workers haven't understood that inflation will come. This causes the real wage to decrease because the price of goods has increased but the nominal wage hasn't changed. So with the same nominal wage, you can buy less goods or set differently with the, the, the same resources, real resources, employers can uh, hire more. And uh, workers are fooled into accepting these new jobs because they think that uh, they, they correspond to wage, the wage they want. Because in Friedman's mind, it's people's labor supply that determines whether they accept the job or not. And people will not accept a job if the wage is too low. And in this case, people think that the wage is higher than it is really that it really is. So employment will increase, but eventually people will understand that have been, they have been fooled. They will adjust their expectation, observing the real inflation, and so they will reduce their labor supply to its natural level. And the only way you could fool them again and again is by having an expected inflation at each period. So more and more, actually, so a, a constant increase in inflation, and this leads to hyperinflation, because you increase the rate of increase, and uh, the government doesn't want that, because uh, then your, your monetary system uh, crumbles, uh, it becomes totally unstable. This is what happened in uh, Zimbabwe uh, some years ago, in Venezuela recently, it's, it's a disaster when you have uh, an unco uncontrollable uh, rise in prices. So what it means is that if in the short run you can go from A to B, the, the original Phillips curve, by uh, having a accommodating monetary policy and uh, surprising the workers, so reducing unemployment, increasing inflation, then workers will adjust and uh, decrease their labor supply and the economy will be back to uh, the, its natural level of unemployment at sea. And in the process, the economy would have had uh, higher inflation, so it would have lost in a sense. And this uh, 
red curve is the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, or NERU, or more simply the natural rate of unemployment. It's vertical, and that's why we say it's a, that the long-run Phillips curve is vertical. Because in the long run, for Friedman, there is no trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Unemployment will always be at its natural level at the level where the inflation does not accelerate. And so uh, it was in 68, and uh, his model predicted stagflation because he said uh, if, you, if you, you try to do a monetary stimulus, you will end up with more inflation, but you will not have uh, lower unemployment. So 10 years later, when in stagflation come, came, came up, uh, people adopted monetarism. They thought it was uh, the good model. There are some issues with this model. So first, the NERU, the natural rate, uh, non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, it corresponds to what uh, Keynes calls full employment, right? It's a situation of equilibrium, where everything uh, is... Um, every forces uh, balances, balance out. But then why would you need to have a monetary simulation when you're already at full employment? So even for Keynes, this would not work to try to, to push the unemployment below uh, its natural rate, to, 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 to push employment further higher than full employment. So yeah, said differently, uh, Friedman doesn't say uh, why the, the natural rate of unemployment uh, could be higher than full employment. Um, okay, and the second problem is that it's, it's, it assumes an asymmetry of information between workers and firms. But actually, why would firms know better uh, that there will be inflation than workers? Okay, maybe it's true, but it's a special assumption. Now, okay, I'll try in three minutes. Uh, okay, maybe I'll, I'll take five minutes more if it's okay for you, but to explain uh, Edmund Phelps' theory of the natural rate of unemployment. So at the same time as Friedman, Edmund Phelps, who is also a Nobel Prize, proposed a much, much more convincing model of the natural rate of unemployment. But it was also a more complicated model, so people remember better uh, Friedman's, Friedman's uh, model. And uh, so Phelps, uh, in his uh, work, has uh, many ideas that uh, ha are in advance of his time and, uh, and, uh, and will be uh, reused in other parts of economics uh, decades later. So he assumes that hiring is a costly process for firms. You have uh, to dedicate uh, part of your employees to run the job interviews, uh, you have to train the workers, the new workers, you, etc. So it's costly. So firms want to avoid turnover. So to retain workers, firms want to offer higher wages than competitors, right? So that their employees do not seek a position elsewhere. So uh, at least this is the case if the market is tight. If, if there is not a lot of unemployment, then uh, in this case, workers will not dare to, to try finding a new job elsewhere, or they will have no chance. So the wage growth is equal to the desired wage differential. So the, 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 the difference that firms want to, to have with respect to competitors. They want to have a higher wage than the competitors. That's this desire wage differential. So the wage growth is a function, I mean, this desired wage differential is a function of unemployment and vacancies. So as I said, when there is high unemployment, then firms don't care so much to, to propose a higher wage than competitors. And uh, on the contrary, where there is a lot of vacancies, so open positions in the economy, then they care more and the wage differential increases. Now, if you fix the, the rate of vacancies, you obtain the original Phillips curve. And actually, before uh, Phelps, no one thought about the vacancies. Um, now, 
Phelps is interested in equilibrium, which is a situation where there is no change of uh, unemployment, and uh, he assumes that unemployment changes as a decreasing function of unemployment and vacancies. So the higher unemployment there is, the, the, the higher unemployment decreases, and uh, same for vacancies. The more vacancies, the more unemployment decreases. So equilibrium is uh, when there is no change in employment and no change in wage. Let me close the door. Oops. Okay, and um, now suppose that uh, firms, so this, is, this was a situation without expectation. Now we introduce these expectations about their competitors' wages, which is another terms. So because uh, the competitors will also increase uh, their wages, uh, every firm may, forms an expectation, WE, of that term, they, they want to be above uh, that uh, rate of increase. And what he shows is that the equilibrium does not change by uh, adding this term. It just makes anticipated inflation higher. And it's unrelated to uh, the equilibrium in terms of unemployment or vacancies. Because, um, yeah, as you see, the, the condition of equilibrium is just d equals zero, u, u dot equals zero. And uh, increasing the expectation, like uh, if, if firms think that uh, there will be an inflation of wages, they just uh, add, it, add this term to, to, their, to their wage. And uh, this destroys the trade-off between employment and inflation. The key thing is that uh, firms can anticipate inflation. And, uh, and then this kills off the, the trade-off. So it's similar to, to Friedman's, but the method is different because it provides micro-foundation by micro foundation, we mean that uh, the decision of every agent is modeled. Whereas in Friedman, he looked at things uh, in an aggregate way. Uh, he reasons at the equilibrium and with expectations. And uh, it's a precursor of uh, efficiency wage. It's a theory we'll see in a few sessions uh, that explain why wage is higher that, uh, than um, than the wage that, uh, that, that will clear the market, that the, uh, that the wage uh, of competitive markets without uh, other effects, such as the, this, uh, this uh, hiring cost, for example. And it's also a precursor of the job search literature. This literature doesn't distinguish between involuntary unemployment and, uh, and voluntary unemployment. Uh, because for this uh, literature, all employment can be uh, explained as uh, the duration between two jobs, and uh, unemployment uh, varies with uh, vacancies and, uh, and uh, unemployment itself. And um, Phelps didn't uh, rest after this. Actually, he elaborated upon his theory by endogenizing the natural rate of unemployment U star. He said that these rates can vary, actually. And uh, he provided a very sophisticated theory uh, of how it could vary. For example, his theory includes a hysteresis, so irreversibility of um, unemployment. This is because workers have some human capital. You know, they, they have some knowledge they, they've learned uh, in the uni and, uh, and in their previous job. And when they are long-term long unemployed, they lose this knowledge, they lose the motivation, and so they become uh, less productive and less employable. And this can make an employment, high unemployment persistent. And this opens up uh, a new justification for uh, Keynesian policies. Although in his model, without this, uh, this part, this uh, later edition, there is, uh, there is only a small room for, for Keynesian uh, policies. Uh, when, uh, yeah, when employment is very high, when employment is, is higher than the equilibrium, then, uh, then you could, um, it could make sense. But otherwise, um, 
No, you, you, you don't want to, you, you cannot uh, succeed in lowering unemployment with inflation in this model. But, uh, but yes, with his later addition, uh, there are other effects that goes on and that can justify that. Do you have any question? Yeah, thank you. And next time we'll see new classical economics.